through chapter four, um, which was talking about prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Um, then there's differences between them um, in their structure and the composition. Um, so the major differences is that one has a nucleus and one doesn't. And then one has membrane-bound organelles and one doesn't. So the one that lacks stuff is the prokaryotic cell. So when you see the term prokaryotic, you should automatically think bacteria. And then when you see eukaryotic, it could be fungus, it could be protozoa, it could be an animal, it just kind of depends on what kingdom um, they belong to. Um, so then we started talking about what's inside of the cells. And so if they're a eukaryotic cell, they have organelles, which are like mini organs. And those are specialized compartments in the cell that have various functions. Um, we talked about ribosomes. All cells have ribosomes because those are the protein factories. It's a unique protein to live. The middle of the cell is just called the cytoplasm, and it's mainly made out of water. It's kind of jelly-like. Um, and then now we're going to talk more about um, the structure kind of from the inside or the outside to the end. Okay, so we're like working our way inside. So first we talked about just the cell differences in a general sense of prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, and now we're gonna talk more about some of the structures that are inside the cell and that are surrounding the cell. Um, so basically cells need to be protected. Um, you're trying to protect the inside of the cell from the outside. Um, so they have, may or may not have a cell wall, and then they all have a, a membrane, which is the final protective layer that protects the cytoplasm from the outside world. And then if they're a eukaryotic cell, they also have a structure called a cytoskeleton. And it's what it sounds like, it's a cell skeleton. It keeps all the organelles like lined up properly so that they're not like bumping into each other, I guess. But since prokaryotic organisms don't have um, organelles, they don't need a cytoskeleton. So that's one of those differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic that the prokaryotic do not have a cytoskeleton and the eukaryotic do. Um, how you can tell uh, these different groups apart from each other is by the composition of their cell wall. So like, what is it made out of? So one of the ways that you can tell bacteria apart from each other is by the amount of peptidoglycan that is in their cell wall. So that's a substance that's unique to the bacterial cell wall. And that's the um, premise behind the gram stain. When I mentioned gram positive and negative organisms last time, that has to do with the amount of peptidoglycan that they have in their cell wall. And then if they're archaea, they don't have peptidoglycan. So that's why archaea are not bacteria, because they lack that component. And we'll talk more about its structure. Then the different um, kingdoms have different um, cell wall composition. So some of you might already know that plants have cellulose. And we're not really able to break down cellulose, so that's why certain plant matter comes out your digestive tract, like you don't break it down, like corn and stuff like that. Um, fungi has chitin, and depending on how much chitin, that's why like mushrooms are so firm, because chitin is the same carbohydrate that you find in insects and crustaceans. It's what makes their shell hard. Um, yeast have their own sugars too. Um, typically they'll have what's called glucan and mannan, which are just types of sugars. And the reason I just bring this up is because the drugs that are antifungal are gonna act specifically on those sugars potentially, and those sugars are not found in bacteria. So that means that an antifungal is not gonna work on a bacterium, and an antibiotic is not necessarily gonna work on a fungus because they have a different chemical makeup, they have a different structure, so the same drugs don't work necessarily. Protozoa are like animals, 
And animal cells do not have a cell wall. So they just have a membrane, and then sometimes they're covered in a sugar sticky substance that protects it that's called glycocalyx. So glyco means sugar, it's a sugar coat. And it's used, I guess, to just kind of lubricate the cells and protect them. So this composition of the cell wall basically coincides with the different kingdoms. Like within a different kingdom, uh, within each kingdom, they'll have a similar cell wall composition. And sometimes in the lab, that is a way you can tell organisms apart from each other by doing differential staining techniques that will stain the cell wall based on the composition of the cell wall. And so that's a way you can identify your different microorganisms. So this is just a simple little graphic I made. Um, if you were a bacterial cell, you would have a cell wall, anaplasm memory, and the cytoplasm, which is just the inside of the cell. If you're an animal cell, imagine that the cell wall is not there. Okay, so if you're an animal cell or protozoa, you don't have a cell wall. But you do have a membrane, because everyone, every cell does. Um, if you are fungus, you're going to have a cell wall. And if you're a plant, you're going to have a cell wall. But what it's made out of is going to be different. So imagine that the bacterial cell wall is these like red bricks, but then the fungal cell wall is like purple bricks. And then the plant cell wall is like blue bricks. So the components, the carbohydrates and the proteins that make up the cell wall is different for different kingdoms, like different organisms. Okay, the plasma membrane, which is underneath the cell wall, its main function is what's called selective permeability. So what this means is that not anything can get inside of the cell. Only things that are small enough to get through or things that are not charged in the wrong way so that they get repelled by the cell are able to pass through. And so there's different ways that things can pass through the membrane. It can happen passively or it can happen actively, which is where it requires energy. So they call this a phospholipid bilayer, and that's these, uh, these little things here, these building blocks of the membrane. That's the, phos uh, the phosphate part, and then this is the lipid part. Lipids don't really mix with water, so they're hydrophobic. So those are tucked inside. And then the, the phosphorus at the ends are um, hydrophilic. They are attracted to the water. So this separation and charge across the membrane is partially why certain things cannot pass through. Um, but depending on what the organism is, it might have a slightly different structure to the cell membrane, but the overall function is the same, and that's selective permeability. So you don't want just anything coming inside the cell, because if the cell is the functional unit of the organism, then you have to protect the cell. Like you have to protect its structural integrity, and you have to protect it chemically and prevent bad things from getting inside. So I mentioned that there's passive and active movement across the membrane. Passive is just where it just flows. So things usually go with the flow or with the concentration gradient. So normal concentration gradient, the normal way that things travel is from high concentration to low concentration. So for example, if you think of like, if you were in a crowded like bar or something, like. Typically, you don't want to be like elbow to elbow, so you naturally move towards where there's less people. And that's kind of how molecules just move too. Like they move from where there's more of them to less of them. But if you want to go the opposite way, then that's going to require energy. And it's going to require the help of the, like a carrier protein or a channel protein of some sort, a transporter. So think about like, you and your friend are trying to make your way to the restroom, but you got to travel upstream against the crowd, right? So you hold hands so that you can get through to the restroom because you're going against the crowd. And that's active transport. It, it costs more energy to do that. So it's always going to be more energy if you're trying to move against the concentration gradient. So this is just 
This is just showing visually the differences between them. Um, so if something is like passive, it will just flow across the plasma membrane. So typically things that are really small and important things like water, they'll just move passively across the membrane because everything needs water to live. So simple diffusion is where it just goes straight across. And then you have channel or carrier mediated. And those are like little gatekeepers that they have to go through to get across. Okay, so it's like a doorway or a gate that they have to go through. And then active transport requires an energy input. So that's imagine you're going against the stream, against the current. That requires more energy. And it also requires a transport protein to help. And that's when you're going against the normal flow. So the normal flow is go from high concentration to low concentration. If you want to go the opposite way, then that requires energy. Okay, because you're trying to go against the normal flow of things. So this is how um, you control what's going in and out of the cell. And this is how you move what's going in and out of the cell. You either move it passively or actively, depending on which direction you're trying to move it. So an important type of diffusion is called osmosis. So water is called the universal solvent. Most biological um, compounds are dissolved in water. Cells are surrounded by water. And so it's important that the flow of water in and out of the cell is controlled. Because if too much water goes in, the cell can burst. And if too much water leaves, the cells can dry out and then rupture also. So the passive movement of water across the membrane is called osmosis. And you're moving from a higher concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. And so the concentration of water depends on how much solute is dissolved in that water. So the solute is what is dissolved in the solvent, and that's what makes a solution. So for example, if you had sugar water, sugar would be the solute, and then water would be the, um, the solvent, okay? So if you have one side of the membrane that has a higher concentration of water than the other, that's gonna cause water to move from high to low just like it normally would, okay? But instead of talking about the actual solute, you're really talking about the solvent, which is water. So the water wants to move naturally from a high concentration to a low concentration. All right, so um, if they're in equal concentrations of water, then that's called an isotonic solution. And it's not saying that the water isn't moving, it's saying that the net movement is zero. So the movement in and out is equal. That's what happens in isotonic solution and that would be a normal, a normal state. If you're in a hypotonic solution, that's when you're in a dilute solution. And so, um, like, I don't know if you guys have heard, like you can, you can actually kill yourself by drinking too much water because you'll literally like flood your cells. Like if there's too much water around your cells, it's gonna force it inside because there's less water inside your cells than outside. And then that can cause the cells to rupture and that's called a hypotonic solution. So that's when it's too dilute, basically. And then the opposite situation is where you have a hypertonic solution so that's where you have less water outside than inside the cell. And so that's gonna naturally make water leave the cell to try to equilibrate those um, concentrations. So that's why like you can't drink like salt water um, because basically it'll, it forces water out of your cells. And you'll notice like even if you like, like if you swim in the ocean, your skin gets all dry and weird feeling because it's literally like sucking water out of you. Like, because the water's just trying to equilibrate. And there's less water outside because there's more salt. And so it's trying to move from the higher concentration to the lower concentration of water. And then that's why the flow, the net flow will be out. And those cells can also rupture because of that. Because when the water flows, it, it produces osmotic pressure on the cell and that can cause it to rupture. So this is something that, um, you know, those of you that are clinicians like probably notice like 
you give different like IV bags for different like situations, I guess. Like so, if a patient is like severely dehydrated, you might give them a different mixture than if you're just kind of keeping them prepared for surgery, maybe, and you're just doing like a steady state to keep them like in normal conditions. Um, and it has to do with this. It has to do with um, osmosis and how water moves across a membrane. And luckily, this is passive because water is really important. We don't want to have to control or input energy to move water like back and forth. Okay. Um, so there's a quick little um, animation that shows this visually. And then the worksheets in the booklet have, um, here, let me see if I can find a different link, have a practice problem. Sorry, I guess that link is broken now. state that the cell needs to be in. And so we can kind of manipulate this 
uh, as far as like keeping cells or not keeping them around. So like for example, a lot of food preservatives are salty and that will actually dry out any microbes that are contaminating that food. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of another example. Um, there's also like, if we think about active transport, I think there's antibiotics that actually are not able to enter through those portals too, and then that can cause resistance. So like there's gram negatives that will not allow antibiotics to pass the membrane. So the membrane permeability is important um, because it protects the cell, but also allows nutrients that you need to get across. Um, but we can also manipulate that if we want to um, keep things in or out of the cell for whatever reason, if that makes sense. All right, so then underneath the plasma membrane is the cytoplasm. So cytoplasm literally just means like cell structure. It's the middle of the cell. So if we thought about this cell as this room in here, this whole space in the middle would be the cytoplasm. And then this inner wall would have been the membrane because it's like thinner. And then the outer building wall would be the cell wall, like that's made out of bricks or whatever. Um, so now we're talking about what's in the middle of the cell. And in the prokaryotic organisms, there's not a lot in the cytoplasm because they don't have organelles and they don't have a nucleus. And because they don't have organelles, they don't have a cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is this like protein matrix basically. Um, and these protein fibers make like a grid inside that gives some extra stability to keep the organelles in their proper alignment. And then they also move as part of cell division and pull everything apart. Um, but that's not seen in bacteria because they don't have membrane-bound organelles, so they don't need a cytoskeleton. What they do have is DNA, because all living things have DNA. And then they have um, ribosomes, because all cells need ribosomes, because all cells need proteins to live. All right, the cytoplasm is also used for storage. And the storage things are just called slightly different things if you're talking about bacteria versus eukaryotic. So in eukaryotic organisms, they typically call them vacuoles. And a vacuole is just a storage pocket. So a lot of times it'll have water or air in it. And a plant cell has a huge vacuole usually because they like to store a lot of extra water. And so the size of the vacuole kind of depends on what type of eukaryotic organism it is. They don't call them vacuoles in bacteria, they call them inclusions. But it's the same principle. They're storing like extra whatever those little bacteria goodies are for later, like food, so that if times get tough later, then they have their pocket of food that they could um, like use as a resource. Okay, so there's storage space in the cytoplasm. And it's to store water, gas. Um, it also helps dissipate some of the pressure by distributing the pressure in those like spaces. Like having those spaces in between makes it so that they're not as sensitive to pressure, I guess. All right, so we said one of the main differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic is that eukaryotic, that term means true nucleus. And prokaryotic means before nucleus. So the prokaryotic, aka bacteria, don't have a nucleus, they have something called a nucleoid. So nucleoid means resembling a nucleus, but it's not a true nucleus. It's not a membrane bound compartment. It's essentially an open space. So the bacterial cytoplasm is like pretty empty. Like it's pretty much just like an open space that has the bacterial chromosome and it's not separated from the rest of the cell. Unlike eukaryotic organisms, we're like, we're picky about our DNA. Like we keep it in a special compartment because it's like super important. Like that it stays correct and it stays undamaged and, and that kind of thing. So this is the difference in the nucleus versus the nucleoid. Um, this is showing the nucleus um, of a eukaryotic organism. And you can see that it has a membrane around it, this envelope. Um, and then it has super condensed um, DNA, which is the 
and that's what makes up the chromosomes, the pairs of chromosomes. Um, and then there are special pores that allow things to selectively leave. So one of the things that happens uh, for eukaryotic organisms is that they will do transcription in the nucleus, which is where they turn their DNA into RNA. And then it can snake out through these pores, and then they can do translation, which is to make proteins, out in the cytoplasm. So that's why the ribosomes are like right next to the nucleus, because they have a function that works together. So a lot of times you'll see organelles that have like related functions, they'll be like by each other. So this is what you would see in a eukaryotic cell. And then this is what it would look like in a bacterial cell. So you can see that it's not quite as organized, although there is kind of a space where the DNA is. So the main chromosome where it exists is called the nucleoid. And the nucleoid is kind of hard to explain. It's like this irregular like cavity in the cell. And it's not necessarily protected from anything. And then the other thing that bacteria will have is extra chromosomal DNA that's called a plasmid. And plasmid are little circular pieces of DNA that they picked up from other places. And that's another reason why bacteria are so different. Like I can't pick up random DNA from like Ashley. Like that's not how we exchange genetic information. But if we were bacteria, we might be able to pass DNA to each other. So the way they do their genetics is a little bit different, which we'll talk about later, okay? So a nucleoid is like a irregular space where DNA is in bacteria. And then a true nucleus is a membrane-bound organelle that has the genetic material enclosed in it. And that's found in any eukaryotic organism. All right, so DNA, we'll talk more about it later, but it's the genetic material. So your genes are made out of DNA. And DNA is made out of nucleotides, which is a four-letter code. Um, and the way it's packaged into the cell depends on what kind of organism you are. Um, so bacteria have a circular chromosome. So if you imagine that DNA kind of is like two strands that are twisted on each other, and then they put that in a circle. So they arranged it in a circle. And then eukaryotic DNA is linear. So it's not arranged in a circle, it stays in a line, but they still compact it. So because eukaryotic organisms are more complicated, they literally have more DNA. And so the way they package their DNA is different because there's more of it. So they use these special packaging proteins that are called histones. And it acts as kind of like a spool. So like if anyone knits or does anything with string, you know how you wrap it around to kind of keep it all neat and together. And if you wrap it correctly, when you undo it, it doesn't tangle on itself. Like it'll actually just unravel. And that's what you're hoping will happen with your DNA, that you can coil it and package it very tightly so that it can fit in that tiny nucleus. And instead of having a round chromosome, you have pairs of linear chromosomes. So each chromosome is like hundreds and thousands of genes. Okay, and a gene is just an area of DNA that encodes for a protein. Okay, and we'll say that again when we get to chapter eight. All right, so RNA is the cousin molecule of DNA, and it's important for making proteins. So one thing to note is that the way prokaryotic cells make protein is a little bit different than eukaryotic cells because it's a one-step versus a two-step process. So because prokaryotic organisms don't have a nucleus, they can transcribe and translate in one step. So they can go from RNA to protein at the same time. Like as soon as the RNA is made, they can immediately start making a protein. But eukaryotic organisms are a little bit more picky, and they also have the nucleus, and you saw how it was all enclosed. So it's a two-step process. And they also do editing, where they cut out certain pieces and splice it back together before they ship it out of the nucleus. So it's a, the proofreading process is like longer, I guess, like fixing it. And the first step, which is called transcription, 
happens in the nucleus. And then the last step, which is called translation, happens in the cytoplasm. But because bacteria don't have a nucleus, it all happens out in the open in one step. Okay, so that's a significant, one of the significance of one having a nucleus and one not having a nucleus, is how they process the genetic material and how they store the genetic material is going to be different between them. All right. Um, as far as how the cells organize themselves, um, since this class is dealing with micro and a lot of bacteria, I don't go into like mitosis. Um, but if you've had biology before, you've probably heard of mitosis, which is the name for eukaryotic cell division. So this is what happens during um, the division of not sex cells, because sex cells, it's called meiosis. But mitosis is what regular cells do, like your skin cell would do, I guess, mitosis or whatever. And so the difference is in the complexity. Because eukaryotic cells are bigger, and more complex, it takes longer to do mitosis. Like it's more on the scale of hours to divide a cell. Whereas prokaryotic organisms are smaller and they're less complex, so it's actually a matter of minutes that they can divide. And so it's a different process that they typically call binary fission. So said another way to simplify, Cell division in eukaryotic organisms is called mitosis. Cell division in prokaryotic organisms is called binary fission. This outcome is the same. It's to make a new cell. But the process is different because the cells are different. Okay, so since the eukaryotic cell has so much more stuff, it's going to take longer to do mitosis. And connecting that to another thing is that then certain things will take longer to grow in lab than most bacteria. Like bacteria divide very quickly because there's not as much stuff to copy. Like all they have is that DNA in the middle basically and some ribosomes. All right, the other thing is how they reproduce. So remember we said that there's sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. So I made a little diagram, which one is sexual reproduction? The one on the right, right? Because we see that there's two parents that are hopefully genetically different. I don't want to make fun of like Arkansas or Alabama or anything. There's any more from there. But hopefully they're genetically different, right? Because diversity is, is actually a really good thing in biology. So you have two genetically distinct parents, and then they made an offspring that's not exactly like either of the parents. So that's why I depicted that the blue and the red made a purple offspring. Because they share traits, and it's not 50-50 either. Because obviously we know that sometimes we look more like one parent, or we don't look exactly like either of them, but we kind of do. And so it's just the way that the genes kind of rearrange every time. Now the asexual reproduction is what's happening over here. They're just making clones of themselves. And that's what bacteria do. But sometimes they'll have a mutation that can come randomly. And so they might not be exactly the same. And that's when we get strains of bacteria. So remember when I talked about like you could have E. coli 0157, um, you could have E. coli 064, there's like an 0104. They are all E. coli, but they are slightly different genetically. So they're all clones of each other, but sometimes random mutations can pop up or mutations can be acquired through gene transfer. And that's something that bacteria do, not eukaryotic organisms. So the organisms that reproduce um, asexually are um, bacteria, um, fungus. Most fungus is asexual. And then some of the protozoa, okay, the little swimmy guys. And then the things that produce sexually are eukaryotics like plants and animals. Um, so like worms reproduce sexually. And then there's some things that do both. So example of that again is protozoa. There are protozoa, the little swimmy guys, that can produce in both methods. They can have a sexual phase and an asexual phase. So it just depends on 
the organism. And I have a chart that summarizes this, which I wish I had brought it, um, but I'll post it and like send it to you guys where it just has it all in one little nice page that talks about the differences between them. Okay, as far as the shape of the cell, the overall shape, this is kind of switching gears a little bit, talking about the general morphology. Most cells are like round, right? <laughs> like animal cells are round shape. And then plant cells are kind of, if you remember the, well, we haven't looked at the onion cells yet, but they're kind of rectangular. And then bacterial cells can be pretty diverse, but these are the three main shapes of bacterial cells. So coxae, which are like round, and bacilli, which is kind of a rod or a pill shaped. And then spiral is like where it's curved. And so this information can only really be seen under the microscope and if you stain the organism because they're so tiny that um, stain is needed to provide contrast. So by knowing the shape and the stain reaction and then coupled with whatever clinical information you have, that's a way you can make a presumptive um, identification and then initiate treatment is by looking at those things together. So this is just showing the different cell shapes. As I mentioned, most animal cells are round. And then plant cells are kind of more angular. And it probably has to do with the fact that they have to be able to withstand water pressure as water is moving through the cells. And then bacteria can be rod shaped or round or spiral, which is like curved. So those are the basic shapes of cells. Okay, there's other appendages on the cells, which are part of the cell wall. Um, a lot of cells have a capsule, which is a sugar coat made out of a substance called glycocalyx, which is kind of like a glue. And bacteria use capsule for um, their virulence because if they have a capsule, it makes it hard for the immune system to get through and attack that cell because the capsule gets in the way. Um, flagella are important for some bacteria. It's a tail that allows them to move. Movement is also known as motility, so it's the ability to move around from one place to another. And really the only human flagellated cell is sperm. Like our, our cells are not modal. Like that would be kind of weird actually if our individual cells that make up us were moving, right? Like we wouldn't be like a normal human. And not all organisms can move, but a lot of bacteria, they use that to help cause infection because they can help them navigate that part of the body. And then endospores are a structure that some bacteria make when they get in stressful, um, conditions. So it's a dormant kind of form. They make a protein coat around themselves. So a very common spore former is like C. diff and that's why it's such a so prevalent in hospital settings because the spores are hard to disinfect. Um, it's actually like if you used alcohol that's not going to kill spores because they're they're impenetrable. You need to physically wash spores off and that's why hand washing works better for C. diff than just using like alcohol sanitizer. So there's only two bacteria that actually make spores and it's Clostridium and Bacillus. Clostridium is the C in C. diff. That's why uh, that, that's where that name comes from. So this is just visually showing what capsule can look like. So strep, which causes strep throat, has a capsule. This is highly magnified 20,000 times. And this little fuzzy halo that's around it, that's the capsule, which is made out of sugars. And those sugars help it resist the immune system because it's sticky. So the immune cells are not able to like actually penetrate the bacteria. But we can also use what the capsule's composition is to identify bacteria. So when I mention that you have like group A strep, group B strep, the difference is in the antigens that are on their capsule. Like they have different proteins on their capsule, which means they're different species, different strains. Okay, this is showing the arrangement of bacterial uh, flagella. Um, and you can identify them by the antigens that are in the flagellum. That's where the H designation comes from for E. coli. 
If it's H7 versus H4, it means it has different proteins in the flagellum. Um, and then the way it's attached to the cell and the way it turns, it basically has like a molecular motor in it that cranks and then turns it. And then some organisms will kind of move like a propeller, and then some of them will move more like a whip, like where they'll kind of shake back and forth. Um, so if it's called a peritrichous arrangement, trico means like hair, and peri means around. Those are bacteria that have flagella like all around their cell. Um, monotrichous and polar is where it has one at the end, which is the pole. Um, then you have lopatrichous and polar. This is where they have a tuft at the end. So I imagine kind of like a ponytail that they like whip around and have like braids in it. Um, and then amphitrichous and polar is where they have one at each end. And that's typically what you see with um, spiral bacteria, which are called spirochetes, and they almost move like a spring. Like they'll kind of do this as they move along. So the flagella are really tiny. You can't really see it with a light microscope, but you can do a flagellum stain, which is almost like the idea, like you know how like when you put mascara on, you're trying to bring out those tiny lashes, so you just keep adding layers of mascara. That's what you do to the flagellum to get it to show up. Like you keep adding stain until you can see it because it's like really small. Like you can't really see it with a typical light microscope. So the flagella is important for movement. Movement is helpful for causing disease potentially. And it also allows them to like go get food, like swim from one area to another. Okay, I mentioned the endospores. There's two bacteria that are spore formers, bacillus. And bacillus is of note because that is the genus that anthrax belongs to. And if you remember, Right after 9-11, which some of you were like barely born now, I realize, but um, we had the anthrax like attack or whatever, and they were using spores, which are like dried up bacterial things that can become live if they get back inside a person. And so that's what happens with anthrax is that you inhale those spores, and then they germinate into live bacteria again. And the same thing happens with people that get Clostridium difficile, which is C. diff. They can come into contact with the spores, or the spores can be dormant in the gut. And then especially certain antibiotics, like clindamycin, is known to kill the good bacteria. So clostridium can like bloom in the gut and like overgrow. So they basically form this spore from the inside out. They start layering these like protein coats around themselves. So they're like, oh, times are tough. I'm not in a person anymore. So I'm gonna let all my water out and stop metabolism uh, temporarily and then put a little fortress around myself. And then once I get into good conditions again where there's like food, I'm going to then germinate like similar to a seed sprouting. And so this is a unique thing that bacteria do and it helps them survive so that they can be transmitted from one host to another. All right, the other appendages, I mentioned the spiral organisms that can move like a spring. Sometimes they'll have a spring literally around them that helps them move, and that's called an axial filament. It goes along the axis of the spiral-shaped organism. And so one that's known to move that way is Trepanema pallidum, which is what causes syphilis. So most of the spirochetes which are the bacteria that are shaped like this with the axial filaments are pathogens. Like if you worked in a lab that did anything with spirochetes, it's probably gonna be like a higher biosafety level because those are things that are known to pretty much cause disease in people. Um, so we don't work with them in our lab because our biosafety level is only like one. So we don't work with things that are highly pathogenic like spirochetes. All right, some other appendages, and I feel like in the past I emphasized this more than I do now, and it was probably just because I was just out of school, and it was something that we talked about a lot. It's not as important for you guys to know all the differences between these, um, but these appendages are, in general, used as virulence factors. So these appendages allow bacteria to better cause disease. What they've seen is that when they genetically engineer these bacteria to not have pili or to not have fimbriae, they can't colonize the host as well. And that's because both of these appendages can be used for attachment and motility. And those things are important for colonizing a host. 
you got to be able to like attach yourself to the hose and then you want to be able to navigate that area and like move if you need to. The other thing about pillis that is really um, important is that it's used for DNA transfer. So when I said that bacteria could pick up weird DNA, imagine the pillis being like a straw. And if I could like blow DNA at Cindy with my straw, that's what bacteria can do. They can extend a tube to each other and exchange DNA down that tube. That's what the pillis is. And so they call that conjugation, like conjugal visit. <laughs> like it's like the main way that bacteria could have sex. They don't really have sex, but they can exchange genetic material if one of them makes a pillis. So the pillis is like a protein tube that you can exchange DNA with. And then the fimbriae are like little hairs that they use to adhere to a host. So both of them are potentially useful for them to be virulent, for them to actually cause disease in a person or an animal or whatever. All right, so I started talking about how you could identify bacteria by their cell wall composition. And so almost all bacteria can be classified into two categories of being gram positive or gram negative. And that has to do with the amount of a substance that's called peptidoglycan in their cell wall. Peptidoglycan is found in the domain bacteria. It's not found in the domain archaea. That's a big difference between them. The other difference is that archaea are extremophiles and bacteria typically aren't. So they're both prokaryotic, but they're different in their like makeup. So what we're gonna see is that the gram-positive cells stay purple after the procedure, and the gram-negative cells are red or pink, and that means that they are different bacteria because they can't be both. They have to be one or the other. So we'll talk about why they turn purple and red. All right, so peptidoglycan. Peptido means, is referring to peptide bond. Peptide bonds are the bonds between amino acids, and they're really strong. So it's like a protein bond, basically. And then glycan means sugar. And so this is a protein sugar molecule that has these repeating disaccharide units. Disaccharide means two sugars. The two sugars are abbreviated NAG and NAM. And then glycan is where you have NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, just repeating. And then the rows are connected to each other by the peptide bonds. So that's where the term peptidoglycan comes from. Now, one of the drugs that we commonly use, the penicillin drugs, what they do is interfere with those crosslinks. And so the cell wall of bacteria cannot develop properly in the presence of penicillin drugs. So penicillin drugs interfere with those crosslinks, and vancomycin does too but they act in different parts of that process of making the cell wall. So this is what those, um, the pectin of glycan is made out of basically. So each building block is called a monomer. And it's a NAM and an egg, that's the disaccharide part. And then there's amino acids hanging off of the NAM. And so the amino acids from one connect to the amino acids in the next row. And that's where those crosslinks are made. So there's an enzyme that comes through that's called a transpeptidase because it makes peptide bonds across the row. And that enzyme is unique to bacteria. That's what penicillin blocks. Penicillin prevents that enzyme from making these crosslinks. And then the whole thing will fall apart, right? Like if you imagine that none of these are being made, like these crosslinks, then the rows are not going to be connected to each other and it's going to just like fall apart. What did you say that it was that made the little, the lateral link? Oh, it's a bacterial enzyme that's called a transpeptidase. Uh, and it's saying that it's making those peptide bonds across. So that bacterial enzyme is not something that humans have and because we don't have peptidoglycan. And that's why penicillin drugs will kill a bacterial cell and not us. 
because we're not made out of pentaglycan. So that's where you get that selective toxicity. So if you were asked to like draw or like just for practice, like sometimes you'd be like, draw a pentaglycan. Like literally you could just draw like a little thing like that. It'd be like, it's an M and an A, those are the sugars. And then there's an amino acid chain hanging off. It's got like five amino acids. And then the amino acids on one is gonna connect to the next row. That's how the rows are connected to each other. So it's almost like a lattice. Uh, if you, or you imagine like, you know in your garden you have those little white things that you use to let vines climb up? It's kind of like that. And so there's a bacterial enzyme that goes through and makes all those connections. All right, so then the other dichotomy that you have to be able to compare. So we said that we need to know the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic. And then we also need to know the difference between a gram positive and a gram negative cell wall. So the gram positive cell wall has many layers of peptidoglycan. And it also has a substance that's called tychoic acids that are used for identification, but they're also used to bring stuff in that they want that they need inside of the cell. Um, antibiotics that disrupt peptidoglycan work well on gram positives. And that's why if someone has a gram negative infection, penicillin-like drugs might not work as well unless they're like a stronger later generation drug. Because penicillin drugs attack peptidoglycan. And gram negatives don't have as much peptidoglycan. So those drugs work better on gram positives, which do have a lot of so gram positive, when you see that term, it means they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And notice that I color coded it with purple. It's going to stay purple because that thick layer of peptidoglycan is going to trap the purple dye that you use during the staining process. And this is something that you guys will do several times in lab. It sounds more complicated than it is. Like the procedure literally takes like five minutes. But the significance behind it is what matters. So here's a representation of a gram-positive cell wall. I tried to find the simplest one that I could. So if you remember that the very outside is called the cell wall, and then underneath that is the plasma membrane, and then inside of that, underneath that is the cytoplasm. It's not showing the cytoplasm here. But remember, bacterial cytoplasm doesn't really have anything in it anyway. So here's the peptidoglycan. There's those units, man, mag. So if you go across, you've got man, mag, man, mag, man, mag. That's the name of the sugars. And then they're connected to each other by peptide bonds. So those amino acids are hanging off, and that's what's making the links. And if it's a gram positive, it has a lot of peptidoglycan rows. And when you do the staining procedure, the purple gets trapped inside permanently. And that's why under the microscope, they're going to look purple because the thick layer of peptidoglycan kept that dye inside. Okay, gram-negative cell walls are a little bit different. They actually have two layers to them. So they have an inner membrane and an outer membrane, and then there's a thin layer of peptidoglycan underneath. So if we think about this, let's say that, um, let's say that it's like a sandwich, okay? Imagine a sandwich. So you have a piece of bread, and the one piece of bread is the plasma membrane. If you're a gram positive, you have a bunch of stacks of cheese on top. And there's no bread at the top. It's an open face, like weird cheese sandwich. If you're a gram negative, you've got one piece of cheese and another piece of bread on top. So that's the difference. An open face sandwich with lots of stuff piled up versus a regular sandwich, but that only has a thin layer of stuff in the middle. Like that's the difference in, in visually in the cell. So gram-negative cell wall is sandwiched. This is the traditional sandwich I was saying. Here's the bottom bread. Here's the cheese, one slice, then layer of peptidoglycan, and then there's the second piece of bread on top with some extra stuff in it. <laughs> so imagine if there's like some toothpicks with olives or something weird. And that's because gram-negatives have other proteins that actually make them more resistant in general. So gram-negatives are more resistant to antibiotics. They tend to be more resistant to disinfectants because they that outer membrane, the second piece of bread, imagine that it was a different um, type of bread. So like let's say you had a soft bread underneath, and then on the top bread you put like a crusty 
bread, like a sourdough or something. It's thicker, it's harder to get through, it's harder to bite through, and that's kind of what gram negatives are dealing with. Like their outer membrane is hard to penetrate, it has a charge to it, it repels things, they're not able to get through. It's got these porins that are tunnels that can only fit certain size things. And then gram negatives also will actively pump stuff out. So sometimes in their outer membrane, they'll have efflux pumps where they literally spit out antibiotics. So that's just another way of me telling you guys that the drugs that work on a gram positive might not necessarily work as well on a gram negative. And a lot of times when you hear about super bugs, like super infections in hospitals, they're gram negatives because gram negatives are innately more resistant because of that outer membrane. Yes? So is gram positive always bacteria? Yes. And gram negative can be bacteria? No, it is bacteria. Yeah. So you can gram stain anything you want, but it only means something if you're gram staining bacteria. Because the staining technique will stain anything. It will stain your skin. But it's differential for bacteria. So you can't, like, you can technically gram stain fungus, but it's not going to tell you anything about that fungus. Because this test is designed to stain the peptidoglycan that is found in bacteria. Yeah, so said the simpler way, it's differential for bacteria. So only bacteria can be truly designated as gram positive or gram negative. All right, so I talked about the outer membrane being like pretty legit. It won't let things in. It resists the immune system. Um, there's these proteins your immune system makes called complement. And the outer membrane is like, no, nah, like you can't get in very easily. So gram negatives tend to be a little bit tougher. They prevent things from getting inside better. Another substance that is found in gram negative cell wall that's kind of analogous to the tychoic acids that are in gram positives is called LPS. LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide, and this is what's known as the O antigen. So remember when I said there's E. coli O157? What they're talking about is this end of the chain. For every different strain that has an O designation, it's going to be different. So every different number is going to have a different set of sugars at the end here. Um, the part that's actually problematic is this part here, which is called lipid A. Lipid A is an endotoxin. It's embedded in the gram negatives, and it actually triggers a fever in the host. So it's a pyrogenic molecule. It actually will directly induce a fever. So we'll talk more about toxins later. But LPS is primarily a gram-negative thing. Okay, LPS is a molecule that's in their outer membrane. It can be used to identify what type you're dealing with, what strain. But it itself also triggers symptoms in the host. Okay. It triggers an immune response. All right, so then um, we have the actual gram stain mechanism. So you, you get tested on this several times. So usually the first time people are like, uh, I think I got it. Like, so I test you in lecture, like the first time. And then you have like several labs. So you have a couple lab quizzes and you're gonna physically do it. And then of course it'll be on the lab final. Okay, so by the time hopefully class is over, you'll be pretty, pretty comfortable with this. So it's a differential stain for bacteria. Puts them into two large categories, almost all bacteria. There is one exception, which I will mention. Almost all bacteria can be designated as gram-positive or gram-negative. Gram-positive have that thick layer of peptidoglycan, the open-faced sandwich with the whole sack of cheese. And then the gram-negatives have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, so it's two pieces of bread with a, one piece of cheese in the middle. So because of that cell wall difference, they stain different colors. And so the stains that you add are the primary dye, which is crystal violet, it's purple. And then you add a counter stain, which is saffronin. That's going to stain any gram negatives that are in the sample. And then how do you tell the difference between them with the decolorizer, which is the alcohol? And I'll go through these steps. And then the mordant is the iodine. The iodine is actually what binds with the crystal violet to keep it inside the cell. So there are a lot of different videos about this. And, I'll, and I will end up posting some stuff in lab about gram stain. But essentially what happens is, you get the bacteria, 
and you heat fix them to a slide. So once you heat fix them, they're dead. They're just on the slide. Okay. Then you take that slide and you add crystal violet to it. When you add crystal violet, everything's purple. Like it just stains everything purple. Then you add iodine and everything is still purple because what the iodine is going to do is bind with the crystal violet and now it's very much in there. Permanent. Permanent. Yeah. Then the third step is important because that's the differential step because if you have any gram negatives in your sample, they're going to get decolorized by the alcohol because the alcohol is going to strip off that outer membrane and the purple is going to leak out. And so those grand negatives will temporarily be clear. Now, if you look at it under the microscope at that point, you wouldn't be able to see them. So that's why you counter stain them with the saprinin, which is the red dye. And then microscopically, what you end up seeing is that any gram positives in the sample were purple. They had the thick layer of peptidoglycan to retain the purple dye. And any gram negatives are red or pink because they got decolorized by the alcohol. And then you had to counter stain them with red so that you could see them again. So said another way, the gram stain reaction directly correlates with the composition of the cell wall. Okay, it directly correlates with the composition of the cell wall. So when you see gram positive bacteria under the microscope, you can assume that they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. When you see pink or red, you can assume they have a thin layer and they're gram negative. And then that, coupled with your clinical information, can give you a presumptive diagnosis and let you know what treatment might be appropriate. So for example, let's say you had a urine sample from a patient, and usually like UTIs are caused by E. coli. E. coli is a gram negative rod. So if I gram stain the person's urine, and I see gram-negative rods everywhere, I'm like, it's probably a typical E. coli infection. And then I can do some other stuff to be sure. But what if I see a bunch of like gram-positive brown cells? That could be causing the infection or it could be a bad, dirty, like a dirty catch because any bacteria from the skin could have contaminated the urine sample. So by me having a general knowledge of what typically causes a UTI, I might be able to decide is that, that's just contamination or is it what actually caused the problem depending on how much is there? So the significance of the gram stain is that you can identify and diagnose and treat potentially from that information, okay? Now I said there was an exception and the exception is the acid fast bacteria. The most important one being tuberculosis. So mycobacterium tuberculosis can't be gram stained because it has a slightly different cell wall that will not allow the dye to penetrate from the gram stain. So that substance is called mycolic acid. Mycolic acid is waxy. If you think about like a crayon, you know how crayon resists, like if you try to put marker over crayon, it like won't go in there. And that's what we're dealing with with the tuberculosis cell wall is that it has this waxy sub substance that's hiding the peptidoglycan. Because remember, all bacteria have peptidoglycan, but in the case of mycobacterium, you can't get to it with the gram stain, so you do an acid fast stain instead. So it uses slightly different dyes, but the principle is the same. And since these dyes, with the addition of heat, can penetrate, what you end up seeing is that your non-acid fast bacteria, which are normal bacteria, will be blue after the procedure. And then anything that's acid fast would be red. So what's the significance of this clinically? Let's say you had a patient that had some funky like respiratory problems. You do a sputum culture and initially you don't see any growth, right? Because mycobacterium is a really slow grower. It could take like two weeks for you to get results back from a culture. But if you stain the sputum and you see a result on their chart that says acid fast bacilli, then they might have tuberculosis. Like, because there's, it's literally the only, one of the only things that's acid fast that would give that result with those symptoms, okay? So almost all bacteria can be called gram positive or negative. There's one exception that's important and that's tuberculosis. It can't be gram stained. You have to do the acid fast instead. Okay. 
All right, guys, so if you have not taken a look at the worksheets yet, I feel like those would be extremely helpful. Like, literally, if you just do the worksheets, I think you would be fine, like, on Thursday. So I'm going to have hold my review session, and I'm going to record whatever, whoever shows up. Um, I'll just record whatever we talk about. I usually type it up in a document, and then I post that also, and I'll post the video. Um, so I think that's tomorrow, like, noon or 1230, I can't remember. Um, so if you can make it, that's great. If you can't, just look for the recording. Okay, and then I think if you do the worksheets, you're going to be fine. They're in the booklet that I gave out, the green booklet. So they're like at the back, and they have the answer key too. Okay. All right, guys, so I'll see you in lab at 1130. If you have any questions, let me know. If you did not get a green book last week, I have a couple. <laughs> so on the COVID discussion, oh, on the Corona discussion, yes. are we really supposed to have a hundred words per each answer, or is yes. that a hundred? Oh, okay. which a hundred words is literally like this. this is I mean, like two paragraphs. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I don't even think it's two paragraphs. A hundred words is like one paragraph. Three hundred words is like a big paragraph. Yeah, because I just don't want people being like, I think this is bad. And that's like all they say. It is bad, though. No. So it is, right. But I mean, I want you to like say something with substance. And I figure 100 words is a good minimum to say some uh, 